bring in Peter Wallison from American Economic Institute. He's been the punching bag of liberal Democrats recently. Peter, great to have you back. Peter, I've got two, got two wall things I want to put up here. First of all is one you yes, wrote sir. up, and this is Fannie Mae's 2006 10K report. And this is by you. These strategies include entering into some purchase and securitization transactions with lower expected economic returns than our typical transactions. And that was this pushback with Joe. Okay, so Peter Wallison, that was actual language at the top of the boom by Fannie Mae, wasn't it? That was actual uh, language. You dropped out there for a minute. Yes, this is this was exactly Tom what they said in their 10K in 2006, and what they admitted there, uh, which is basically what I've been saying all along, is that they were required by the affordable housing requirements of the government uh, to make loans that were not going to be profitable to them, and which in fact were going to cause losses. That is what the that was what caused the financial crisis. Is uh, what. Fannie, and May, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were forced to do by government policy. On, on a waiting basis, this is critical, Peter Wallace, and are you saying the entire crisis was triggered by this, or was this just an important element within uh, the set of issues? This was a very important element. It wasn't entirely the crisis, but the reason it was important is that Fannie and Freddie were the largest uh, producers of the subprime and other high-risk loans that were in our financial system in 2008. There were 27 million such loans, and 19 million of those we can trace directly to government policy. Fannie and Freddie were most of those. So that's the story of the financial crisis. And people like, for example, Joe Nocera, have said that Fannie and Freddie followed Wall Street, but the data is quite the opposite. And this proves that this quote that you uh, had up from uh, the 10K proves that it was government requirements on Fannie and Freddie that made this happen. Okay, and here's Joe Nassura, and I'm a big fan of Joe's work, full disclosure, going after Peter Wallison. Peter Wallison had already released his own one-man descent, a lonely, loony cri de corps that placed the blame for the financial crisis entirely on Fannie, Freddie, and the federal home policies. Did you say that, Peter? Did you say that it was entirely their fault? Uh, no, I didn't say it was entirely Fannie and Freddie. It was actually the Department of Housing and Urban Development that used Fannie and Freddie to drive down mortgage underwriting standards. This was their policy starting in 1992. And they used the affordable housing requirements to do that so that by 2008, 27 million, half of all mortgages in the United States were subprime or otherwise weak. This is the story. And uh, anyone else who wants to defend the government can do so if they want, but they're not going to be able to do it with any data because the data is in my dissent. And it shows unequivocally that it was the government's responsibility. And I thought it was important, folks, to bring this up, to walk through this with Peter Wallace and this idea, this nuance of not so much who's to blame, but the idea of getting to a constructive resolution of what occurred, much of it weighted upon government policy. Peter Wallace, and let's bring up a chart here which shows how Fannie Freddie has disappeared. And I just entitled the chart, folks, suddenly. I hope I spelled it right today. Fannie Mae outstanding mortgage debt off a cliff, and it all, all went over to the government. Peter Wallace, and where are we right now and how much our government owns of this disaster from Fannie and Freddie? From Freddie? Uh, the, the regulator of Fannie and Freddie has made an estimate, and uh, they're suggesting that when it's all over, the losses will be, will be between $221 billion and $363 billion uh, in the, on, the, on the taxpayer's credit card. Uh, I think that's a little optimistic, in fact. I think that the losses will be greater than that. Uh, they all depend very much on what happens with housing prices from this point on, and the overhang is tremendous. We still haven't seen the bottom yet, yeah. so I think the losses will be even greater. Uh, Elian, bring up a but case the, show. The worst. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. 
please go ahead. I was going to say the worst loss, the worst loss, of course, is what it did to our financial system, what it did to cause a recession and the unemployment that we have today. And then, of course, we have the Dodd-Frank Act, which was adopted by Congress last year, and that will make it much more difficult, uh, I believe, for us to have a quick recovery. Within that recovery and within what we do with Fannie, and my reading, folks, is $400 billion plus on a lot of this. This is from various different investment firms that are estimating out. What would you like to see the government do now? What would be politically reasonable to do right now, Peter Wallison? Uh, actually, we are moving into a position where I think we can have a reasonable outcome here. Uh, last week, the, uh, the Obama administration said that if we could return to a completely private financial system for mortgages. And that is something that I and several others here at the American Enterprise Institute, and I know many Republicans in Congress, support. Um, so I think there is a basis here for us to return to a private system of mortgage finance, leaving out Fannie and Freddie, reducing and eliminating Fannie and Freddie over time, and replacing a government-backed system which has cost the American taxpayers a fortune over the last 25 years, just eliminate that system entirely and use high-quality mortgages, prime mortgages, as the way we run our uh, our housing finance system. Peter, 30 so seconds. I think we have a possibility of success here. Peter, just 30 seconds here. What this really comes down to is we're looking for a free lunch, aren't we? Oh, sure. Well, everyone wants to get into a government subsidized program. They think that they're getting a benefit from this, but as taxpayers, they're not getting a benefit. After a number of years, the losses come home to roost. And that's simply because the government yeah. never gets paid for the risks it takes. Tom. Well, uh, you, know, you, you look at what's going on and we got to move on. Here's a chart on foreclosures. You mentioned this earlier, Peter, that we've gummed it up a little bit with Dodd-Frank. How bad have we gummed up the foreclosure process? Well, this is really, a, this could be a really serious problem, Tom, um, because if we cannot uh, continue with the foreclosures, we're going to be hurting the banks, we're going to be hurting small business, and we're going to be hurting all of the people who are actually paying their mortgages. The failure to foreclose means that there, there are large numbers of people who are not meeting their mortgage obligations, and the banks, for that reason, do not have the money they need to make loans in their local areas. They're not getting paid right. on these mortgages. Well, with, so with we the, have to get this thing settled. And I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that, Peter Wallace. And why the delay? Are we trying again? And I've asked you this question probably three times. Are we still trying to have a pain-free crisis? Yeah, I think that's part of it. I think people believe that uh, there isn't any need to foreclose on these mortgages, that it's being, it's being mean to do that, uh, that uh, we ought to allow people to remain in these homes indefinitely. But that has a terrible effect on the morale of others who are fighting and, and struggling to pay their mortgages. And when they see their neighbors not paying their mortgages, um, then people whose houses are underwater, that is to say the houses are worth less than the mortgage on them, uh, uh, do what is called a strategic default. They walk away um, and leave the bank right. with, with a house that's empty. Okay. So this is, a, this is a very bad problem and we have to get it solved. It is not something mm. that ought to be treated as just a minor technicality. It is a serious thing. Let's uh, switch gears here, Peter Wallace. And earlier this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance, I spoke with newly minted Congressman, 5th District of South Carolina, Mick Mulvaney, and I asked him if conservative Democrats in South Carolina, do they want budget cuts? If you take a look at the household income versus, you know, government revenues over the last 30 years, it's a joke. The wealth of the government's completely detached from the wealth of its households, and folks don't like it, and that, that crosses party lines uh, where I'm from. And there's a Congressman Mick Mulvaney. Peter Wallace in the budget deficit. It's here. The Republicans are pushing against the Senate and against the president. I mean, it's the same discussion we've had for five or ten years. When is the discussion going to meaningfully change? Well, I hope it changes before 2012. 
But um, if it doesn't change before 2012, if the president is continuing not to take a leadership position here, not to want to give the Republicans an opportunity to negotiate with him about what cuts should be made in the entitlements, then the only way this thing will be settled is to take it up in the presidential election of 2012. But we will then have lost another two years in which we have allowed our budget deficit to spiral out of control. This is a very serious problem. And uh, this country's economic system could be wrecked by a failure to control our own spending. Now, Peter Wallison, thank you so much.